Welcome to I Care Better, Endo Unplugged, where we talk about all things endometriosis. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller, pelvic floor physical therapist and integrative nutritionist. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Paul Tyen, our first video vetted surgeon to come on the show. In addition to being in private practice, he really values research. Part of his training included a two-year postdoctoral research fellowship at the America University of Beirut at a world-renowned lab that offers only three positions per year to medical graduates. And he has continued his path in research, publishing over 40 publications. His research focus revolves around pressing medical issues, such as reducing the risk of adverse events after gynecologic surgery, optimal setup for endo excision, and reducing the amount of incision sites during various procedures. He has over 40 publications and 500 citations and has presented over 25 abstracts at various leading gynecologic surgery conferences. We talked about several really fascinating topics including how the vetting process was very helpful in his practice and his thoughts on why other surgeons may benefit from going through this process. His philosophy of care around endometriosis, really utilizing his multidisciplinary approach and team he creates, including public floor PT, pain management, mental health. He was recently announced on I Care Better as a video vetted surgeon as well as on Nancy's Nook, so you can all find him there. It was such a pleasure talking with him, and I'm excited to share his story, philosophy of care, and introduce him to everyone listening. All right, so I'm so excited to hear more about you and your practice, you are our first video vetted surgeon that's coming on to talk with me. I'm excited to hear a, a lot about who you are, how you practice, how that vetting process was for you, because I actually don't know the, the ins and outs of that as a physical therapist. So before we get into that, though, I would love to kind of hear how you ended up in the field of endometriosis. Yes, and uh, thank you so much for um, having me on your podcast. Uh, I really, really appreciate the opportunity. You know, in terms of how I got into endometriosis, I always feel like when someone gets to the end point or where they want to be in their career, it's always easy to look back and say, you know, for the past uh, two decades, this is exactly where I envisioned myself to be and this is exactly how I tailored my career. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. For every single for every single time, I think the for the past two decades, I think the the only one constant that I've had is um, really the the opportunity or um, getting interested in helping patients and getting them to to a better point in their life. I was always interested in in getting uh, the best care possible to to patients, and uh, eventually that's what was the main reason why I got into medical school, uh, pursued a career in medicine. And over time, if you're interested in hearing the story, that's, uh, I got into an OBGYN residency and eventually into endometriosis. Love it. So in med school, what did you learn about endometriosis? What was your idea of this disease before even getting into your residency? You know, medical school, I did my medical school abroad, um, and that was uh, almost 20 years ago. I think uh, our knowledge of endometriosis has drastically improved over the past uh, past few years, not to say the past two decades. And the same for gynecological surgery in, in general. I think, the, I mean, the, what, what you learn about endometriosis is what you classically read in your, in your textbook, which is at that point, maybe one or two paragraphs. It's just something that you superficially learn about. I think for, endo, for gynecological surgery, and the main reason why I got into, into an OBGYN residency I really valued the, the quality of care that uh, gynecologic surgeons provide to patients. I really appreciate the patient population, healthy young patients, most of the time who had uh, one main issue that got them into the doctor's office. And eventually, if they got adequate uh, surgical care or adequate clinical care, they would get to a much better place uh, in life. And usually, they don't; um, those issues don't linger for a really long time. That was uh, mostly what drew me into, into gynecology, just trying to make a really positive impact. 
That's so great to hear. Yeah, most of the time you deliver some babies, everyone's happy, it goes well. We are very glad in the endo community that you are now part of that. Thank you so much. From your residency, did you see a difference in how you were trained or how they were doing surgery then? Is that what let you then further into the becoming more of a minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon? You do utilize um, robotic surgery is my understanding. Correct, yes. I was um, going into it, I knew I was more interested in the surgical aspect of gynecology. And uh, I was very fortunate that I did my residency training at a place that really had a top-notch, uh, minimally invasive kind surgery uh, division. So from er- early on in the in residency, uh, I was exposed to highly competent uh, surgeons and physicians who really provided uh, uh, top-notch care to patients. And that just reinforced it. Um, you know, a lot of times you hear, I did my training and uh, I wasn't really exposed to uh, to this level of surgery and I really saw a gap and I wanted to, to improve it. Um, I think I'm fortunate enough, fortunate enough from, from day one, I was lucky enough to be, to be part of uh, a group that had exceptional uh, physicians and, and providers. So you practice in DC, is that correct? I practice in the, in the DC area. Uh, we call it the DMV. It's uh, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's three states, I mean, close to each other. I'm on the border of DC um, and uh, in Arlington, which is just across the river from Georgetown. Okay. And as you started to get, you know, more into this, finishing up residency, what was the transition into kind of where you're at now, or is this is where you're at now your starting place, or how did that evolve into your approach that you take? You know, and uh, this is this is really a question I think everyone should be asking themselves. Graduated residency, even before graduating residency, because you really have to make plans in terms of you're planning to do a fellowship. It's really a long process. It's getting more and more competitive. The, the main question I was asking myself, I, w- I was looking at those surgeons who were doing exceptional surgeries, and, um, and I asked myself, Are you, do you think that you're at a level where you can, on your own, get there? Would you operate on a family member that has endometriosis or has a different um, uh, surgical pathology that needed to be treated? And my honest answer to myself was no, I'm not. Um, and OBGYN residency, most of the time, I mean, uh, there are definitely exceptions. Uh, it really provides um, broad uh, level um, knowledge about dealing with, um, with, with almost all gynecological and obstetrical issues. And you, be, you become, by, by, the, by the nature of it, a specialist in a lot of things, you know, obstetrics, delivering babies, managing um, um, high-risk pregnancies, uh, providing care in the, in the office. But there are definitely subspecialties or areas within the gynecological field where you graduate with, um, with knowledge to, to provide adequate care, but not necessarily push it to its limits. Like, for example, cancer surgery or prolapse surgery or pelvic reconstruction. And I truly believe that minimally invasive surgery was, was one of those fields. And that, mm-hmm. that's really what, what pushed me into, into pursuing a fellowship. So you're probably doing, given your history of how you got into this, you are probably doing endometriosis surgeries, but also involved in other gynecological care, like delivering babies and pap smears, you know, the the standard things. Was that difficult to balance the two of those or were you involved with that? Um, It's very difficult to to balance both, yes, Um, because as, um, as a surgeon who does advanced cases of pelvic surgery... It's very taxing. It really requires a lot of energy to uh, be fully focused whenever you're getting those uh, patient referrals into the practice. Um, and on its own, it's a, it's a full-time job. So if you're doing all the other things, uh, it does become um, a little bit more challenging than I think it should be. Um, sitting uh, down with every patient, because most of the, if you're doing minimally invasive surgery, we'll focus more on, on endometriosis, but mostly, mostly what you're getting is those cases that are very challenging that has been referred to you by other specialists who want you to take care of those cases. And that involves someone who had multiple previous surgeries, adhesions, uh, um, pelvic infections, large fibroids. There's a lot that goes into it. And every single surgery eventually becomes a tough surgery. 
once you make a name for yourself within the community, you become the referred person. You're happy, you're the referred person, but you're getting referred to cases that um, not a lot of other surgeons want to do. A hundred percent. And until you switch out of that, I'm sure you're like, got the surgery, you know, 7 a.m. and maybe you're on call and you have to go in for a delivery. I, I can't imagine that that is easy to do, but I'm sure happened in the beginning of your career. It did, yes. Especially yeah. in private practice. If you if you go into a big academic setting, you're, I mean, by, by the virtue of the job, you're at the end of the funnel, right? You're, you're getting referred those cases from day one. If you're going into private practice, you will need to build that, that referral base around you. You will need to prove yourself to um, providers that are referring patients to you. And that takes time. And eventually you need to be working and, uh, and uh, being financially viable to, to be able to practice. Tell us a little bit about your philosophy of care and how you approach patients with endometriosis when they come into your clinic. A lot of times you hear about patients who are, um, who are coming in and getting um, full history and a full physical exam. And then the provider is counseling them about, you know, based on your physical exam, based on your symptoms, I think that you kind of warrant a surgery or not. I approach things very differently. Um, my first questions whenever I'm meeting, my first question whenever I'm meeting a patient is, uh, is an open-ended question. Uh, tell me more about your uh, your day to day. Tell me more about your past month, your quality of life. What's going on? They're open ended questions, and I'm really trying to assess the quality of life of those patients and how pain is affecting their day to day. And the decision to really hone in on the surgical part, the surgical aspect of of providing care for endometriosis patients, for me is really really relies on on their quality of life and what they're going through more than anything else. So approaching, uh, approaching care in that way has been very rewarding. I listen to my patients. I tailor my treatment depending on what they're going through. Because at the end of the day, most of the time, yes, endometriosis can be diffusely infiltrative. It can affect organ function. But most of the time, we're treating subjective measures, which is pain and quality of life. So it's very important to listen. Yes, it, 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 I'm sure your patients have seen other surgeons or doctors in general, maybe the focus has been on this or it's come up in the discussion and probably weren't asked questions in that way, which kind of leads to that gaslighting and dismissal just because simply how you listen and how you ask questions is so important in this population. Fully agree. How long are your your in initial evaluations? It depends. Um, Initially, when I started in, uh, in practice, a lot of my patients uh, came to me with chronic pelvic pain, right? That was it. Uh, nowadays, patients are more and more educated about what's going on, about their differential diagnosis, and um, they, they, have a, they have a good grasp of what's going on. But initially, when you're seeing um, a pelvic pain patient that hasn't been counseled before, you know, this is their first time hearing about it, those visits are long because you really need to sit down talk to the patient, get their, uh, get their input about what's going on with them, educate them about the endometriosis, educate them about treatment options, educate them about surgery, um, future issues that could arise. Those visits are typically longer. Right now, I'm at a point where I'm getting referred a lot of patients for endometriosis. Sometimes it's, it's easy to go over those topics that take a lot of time to, to discuss because Patients are already aware, they already know, they're already in the office, they already have the diagnosis. They're asking me extremely specific questions, which, which is very refreshing. I, I love it when someone is, is sitting there and asking me, you know, Dr. Tayan, do you fulgurate or do you excise? What do you use for adhesion barrier after surgery? I think it's the best thing ever. And for those patients who are extremely well educated, visits are shorter. There's, uh, there's much less to cover. So it really depends on how much the patient comes into the office understanding of what's going on. I'm so glad you said that because I think wherever their knowledge base is on this disease, get a little nervous asking doctors those types of questions because they are worried about the doctor, you know, why are you questioning me? This is what I do. So that's 
very encouraging to hear that you appreciate when patients ask you those questions because I think that just shows that you know you you want to give the best the, your information. You don't want to hide anything. It's it's not about an ego, which that's so refreshing to hear. Yeah, if you couldn't have said it better. I think ego is is the main thing. I think it's, and I've thought about this for 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 a while because you got a lot of patients in your clinic and a significant portion of of the visit early on is about the negative experiences. Yeah. And some of my counseling targets specifically that. And the, the way I approach it, I understand the gaslighting, I understand the false information. I have seen complications uh, from surgeries that were um, not very well planned or, or, um, or done. Yeah. In my mind, I'm thinking whenever that patient's going in to talk to a specialist, an OBGYN specialist, this is someone who spent many decades in training. They really dedicated their lives, tens of thousands of hours to, to care for patients and improve their outcomes. I think whenever someone comes in and, you know, they're having all those symptoms, they're having pain, they're having um, other issues, a lot of confluence of issues around endometriosis. You get to a point where if you don't have a lot of expertise with it, you're not really sure how to proceed. This is where when someone becomes defensive. You know, I have someone here in my office I really want to help them. I don't know how to help them. And this is what you said, ego is, is, plays a big role. I think it's always important to go back and, and say to yourself, you know what, I'm, I'm actually great at treating A, B, C, D, all the way down to Z, but there's one, this one thing I'm not comfortable with treating. Tell your patient, they're, they'll be happy to hear it. I mean, there's a lot Absolutely. of things that I don't know how to treat or I'm not an expert at treating. And I tell my patients, I mean, uh, sorry that you that you came in expecting the, the full treatment. I'm actually going to refer to someone who does it better. And I think chronic pelvic pain and endometriosis definitely falls within that criteria. And I, I educate my patients that, you know, that negative experience that you got really comes from the desire to be better, but that's, that's being um, misdelivered because of ego. I don't know if uh, we're getting that too makes- philosophical, but... Yeah, that makes complete sense, uh, what you're saying, for sure. I, I completely agree. And so many patients would very much appreciate just being transparent. You know, I can do this for you and I can do this, but we got to bring on a team. And it, reading your bios and and just learning a little bit more about you before this, you really do talk a lot about a patient-centered approach and focusing on managing or creating individualized care plans for them based on their primary goal. So with endo, you know, this disease is probably multiple manifestations or there there's probably different considerations just from the disease itself, but right now we just it endometriosis is sort of all one thing. So when somebody comes in for fertility concerns compared to chronic pelvic pain, how does that look in that session and what tools do you use or how may that change the timing of surgery if that's appropriate? I take fertility patients very, very seriously. And the main issue is you really need to understand the depth of um, of the, 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 the issues that are going on around fertility whenever someone shows into your office that's been referred by an REI or by another practitioner for infertility caused by any different reason, right? It's not just endometriosis that's, that's, that causes infertility, even though it does. Uterine septums, uh, fibroids, um, hydrosalpinx, uh, PID, there's so much that, that goes into it. You know, whenever you have a, surgical, a big surgical practice and you're getting referred a lot of patients, you end up booking maybe a month, two months in advance, over the past year, year and a half, I always leave a few spots open specifically for fertility patients. I always do. It's if, if, if anyone's going to be appreciative of you squeezing them in for a surgery that is potentially going to get them to a huge goal in their life, a desire that they want so deeply, it, it makes the, the biggest, biggest difference. Uh, I really um, do my best to, to get those patients in quickly. Um, a lot of my patients that I referred for infertility have done all the previous testing. Um, they've done a hysterosalpingogram, and they know that they have scar tubes. Uh, they have done a pelvic ultrasound. They know that they have um, um, an endometrioma. They've tried a few cycles, not the best at quality. So they get referred with plans. 
mm-hmm. for, uh, for, for surgical management. Which makes a lot of sense because depending on what they coming, they're coming in with a structural issue or a low AMH, it makes sense that the next step would be let's go in for surgery if obviously the reason seems to be endometriosis related. And what are the outcomes you see with surgery alone compared to maybe utilizing other tools in conjunction with surgery like Lupron, for example? Do you use that in your practice? Is there any... I guess, what's your approach to after the surgery happens? What are your outcomes? Outcomes specifically specifically with, with fertility. So for patients who have large endometriomas that are bigger than five centimeters, um, they have been to their fertility docs and they have tried things before they, they, get, to, they get to me. Really, it's pretty straightforward. Um, whenever you have one endometrioma, surgical management is, is pretty straightforward. An endometrioma, I mean, th- there's a few, if you go and read into the specifics or the science about, around endometriomas and surgery, there's so much that goes into it. Um, they're, they're easy surgeries. Whenever the main issue is, is an endometrioma and some superficial endometriosis, endometriomas are, are easy to shell out of the ovary. If it's done properly, if you're if you're respecting the surgical planes, it's a very rewarding surgery. You get the endometrioma out, you reconstruct the ovary back to normal anatomy, you resect some endometriosis, you decrease the pelvic inflammation. Those patients do phenomenally well after. For patients who have bilateral endometriomas, large, they're um, on the MRI or the previous uh, testing that's done before the surgery, they're behind the uterus, you have some most of the time, you'll have rectal involvement. Uh, those surgeries are, most of the time, planned a little bit differently. Uh, it's a multi-specialty surgery. Those patients will also get great benefit. Now, unfortunately, for um, a subset of patients, those who have diffusely infiltrative endometriosis, tubes are scarred. They're dilated. They need to be counseled very, very specifically about surgical outcomes with a, with a scar tube or dilated tube because you're really attached to not removing any organs. You're really attached to keeping your, your, your full anatomy, but sometimes that tube is just not doing you any service. It's doing you some disservice. Um, I counsel them myself. I encourage them to get a second opinion from a fertility specialist. Eventually, most patients will end up uh, making the, the right decision. Now, to go back to the, to the initial point of your question, which I think is brilliant. Yes, I mean, there's a lot of pushback with fertility and endometriosis. I've had patients who have stage three, stage four endometriosis that's been surgically managed that get pregnant spontaneously and they do well. They do, they do well. So in my, in my practice, in my experience, there's definitely value. If I didn't think so, I wouldn't do it. I really think there's value. Yeah, that's what I've seen too in working with various surgeons who are endometriosis, you know, specialist experts, however we want to categorize that, that do good surgeries and they get it all, they see it all. So actually, this is a great question maybe for you. We have a lot of uh, locations in our practice and one of my roles in our practice is to help some of the newer PTs, younger PTs, less experienced PTs with some of these more difficult questions, especially some of our clinics don't have the resources that some of our clinics have. Just a question today came up about fertility with a 20-year-old 20, 20 patient presenting with what seems to be endometriosis, not necessarily concerned about fertility right now, has no idea, and went to a doctor who, who seems to agree that they have endometriosis, but was told, you know, your best chance at, at this, at managing your pain and improving fertility outcomes in the future is to go on Lupron, you can be on it for a year, and you can do add back, it will shrink the lesions. But if you just go in for an excision surgery, it's going to grow back in a few cycles. So when, whenever I hear that, I'm like, I think it's time to get a second opinion. Um, but what is your thoughts on the role of some of these drugs that really get a lot of pushback in the community as far as treatment for endometriosis compared to the use of them for fertility outcomes? So, I mean, they're not treatment, right? And um, if you're if you're um, if you're using the word cure or treatment, 
or even saying, you know, I'm going to give you those medications to help diagnose because a positive, and this is, I mean, first year is if you think they're a treatment or a cure, I think you need to go back to the, to the, to the textbook and read more about it or to educate yourself a little bit more about what a cure is and what a treatment is. And if you're using them for diagnostic purposes, I also think there's a huge gap between reality and, and, and practice. Um, I rarely use GnRH agonists or antagonists. Um, when I say rarely, probably never. Um, I have read the data. I'm fully aware of, uh, of uh, the public publications out there. And I choose um, not to use them. It's, um, I don't see the value. I think if you're the, the side effect profile, the, uh, the long-term health outcomes with, uh, with completely suppressing the hormonal system is, uh, is real. I mean, the studies are out there and, uh, and um, they're, they're very clear. Now, it goes back to, you know, I'm weighing the, the risks and the benefits. The risks are there. The benefits are there. But you can have those benefits by doing other things, right? If you're giving someone a birth control pill that has estrogen and progesterone, you're kind of getting the same effects, the same, the same outcomes based on a lot of studies. If you're giving them uh, norethindrone only, if you're, or if you're giving them progesterone only, because for some reason they can't take estrogen, yes, you'll get some benefit, but also it comes at a cost of a few other things, right? Many Side other effects, things. Weight, weight gain, gut health, uh, higher, um, higher LDL, lower HDL, which eventually if you keep them on, on, someone on them for a really long time, it can really affect their, their cardiac health. There's a lot that goes into it. I don't think it's a, it's a simple conversation, but I try to stay away from it. Um, now, in terms of excision and growing back, unfortunately, a lot of my surgeries are uh, repeat surgeries. Right? Someone, you know, I, um, I have this uh, big endometrioma that's about eight centimeters. There's pre-op imaging. And I went to someone who um, offered me treatment for it. And basically that cyst was especially if there's adhesions around it, right? Yeah. Uh, that cyst was, was popped, it was drained, and then surgery was done. I tell them your rate of recurrence is 100%. It oh, is yeah. going to come back. Now, if that sur same surgery, same resources, right? You're, you're taking, that, taking that patient to the operating room, you're putting them to sleep, and you're doing a excision, you're, you're very... And I mean, there's, a lot, there's a lot of subtleties around re operating on the ovary and removing, removing assists with how you use energy, with, uh, with the way that uh, you suture the ovary after, because you really are trying to maximize their, their ovarian reserve. And mm -hmm. if the same surgery was done, it just takes maybe an extra few minutes where an incision is made on the cortex and you completely excised the wall of the, of the, of the cyst and took it out and resutured the ovary. Yeah, the rate of, recur of recurrence is low. They're going to do much better. Their quality of, uh, of their eggs is going to be better. And their outcomes are going to be better. Yeah. So, um, it's, I mean, what you mentioned exactly, I hear it every day in my practice, every single day. Same. It's frustrating. It's very frustrating. I completely agree with you, too. And when I've seen the outcomes of some of the surgeons who, I, who really know what they're doing, I think some of them are open to the use of Lupron in certain situations, but I don't think that they ever end up needing it because the surgery is goes so well because they do it properly. Correct. Talking about the the risk of recurrence in not just in a fertility context, but in an endometriosis context. You mentioned you just mentioned the endometrioma, but what about other types of lesions as you know, superficial disease versus deep infiltrating? With a thorough surgery, what do you find the recurrence rate is in your practice? So th there's there's a lot of uh, data and studies specifically around that. The the more advanced the stage of endometriosis is, especially when you get into deeply infiltrative endometriosis, the rate of recurrence is there. It's real. It can happen. Uh, if you counsel and consent is such a huge part of your surgery. If you're counseling your patients and telling them, you know, I'm doing a big excision for you, I won't leave anything behind, which is true. And that's your goal going into the surgery, but you're also telling them, you will never have a recurrence. It's unfair. It's not, it's not true. 
Now, the two factors that affect recurrence, the, I mean, the, the patient-dependent factors is, is how infiltrative that endometriosis is, how extensive that endometriosis is. Mm. But from a treatment perspective, doing a complete surgery, really looking in every single place in their abdomen and pelvis, making sure that you mapped all the endometriosis before you touch anything, and then doing a complete excision, removing all those lesions, making sure that you're being very thorough, right? You see uh, some endometriosis lesions that are tiny. You're really investigating how deep they are. You're, you're removing nodules. Not, you're not leaving any endometriosis behind. Will improve their, their chances of not having a recurrence. And also suppression after surgery, usually for six months. I recommend for my patients who are diagnosed with endometriosis, who had a full excision, I tell them, you know, it's an investment in your future. Um, even though you might have side effects with the, with the endometrio with the, with the medication, it really does decrease the chance of recurrence. So usually I start them on a birth control, uh, birth control, which is estrogen and progesterone. And, uh, if they can take estrogen, usually I would put them on a uh, progesterone only uh, option for at least six months. Right. And I see that a lot too. We have all these tools and while birth control isn't a treatment, we very much know that oftentimes it's laid out there if they're 13, 14, having this, you know, take this, it's fine. It, it can help for a significant number on symptom management, but I do think that there is a different role in the use of it prior to having a surgery compared to like what you're talking about as far as after a surgery, kind of keeping it almost just blunted, right? The, the hormone cycles. We know that estrogen doesn't sure. cause endo, but we know it's mediated by it and it really can proliferate. But if you remove it all and then you go on some sort of suppression birth control, and a lot of these people may want something anyways for contraceptive purposes, that you, you do see more benefit in that. You know, one thing, Jandra, I think that's um, not discussed uh, very frequently is patients who have been on uh, a high level suppression, you know, a GRH agonist or antagonist, and uh, they've been on it right up, and, up, right on, uh, up until their surgery. Those surgeries are harder. So for a few reasons. First of all, it's, uh, it's hard to detect all the lesions because they're very, very suppressed. So you really have to do a very thorough examination and um, you don't know what you're missing. And the second thing, surgical planes are a little bit harder to work with whenever someone's been suppressed for, for a very long time, which makes surgery also uh, a tiny bit harder. Usually for my patients who... Um, I am offering surgery for, I try to, if possible, keep them off any suppression for three, four months before their surgery um, for hopefully a more, more, um, a better surgery. Interesting. I, I don't think I've heard anyone say that. And yeah, that's very interesting to, to know that you actually want them maybe off of it before they undergo it. So when you mentioned the surgical planes, are you kind of alluding to... I, or at least I've heard, and this is my assessment, is when you go on these, and even sometimes birth control for a long time, the tissue becomes a little bit more like fibrotic or scar tissue-like. So it changes the way that the collagen or the fibers are cre it, creating more of like a mess in those those planes of like fascia or tissue. Is that what you're, can you explain that a little bit more? I think it could not be explained better than what you said it. It's uh it's the two things is long-term suppression or very high level suppression. And the second thing is a previous incomplete surgery. Yeah. Those, th those two things will, will make or previous complete surgery. Those, uh, those things will make your surgery uh, that much more challenging just because you're, you're dealing with planes that have been obliterated or if someone has, um, has advanced endometriosis that invades the retroperitoneum. It just becomes harder to, to, to operate just because you really have to work hard to find your anatomy, making sure that you're doing a full excision. It becomes a, a more challenging surgery, yes. Yeah. In those patients who have been on that and you surgically excise, do you find – one question I think that confuses a lot of patients in particular is they get their pathology report and it's like, well, it didn't come back as endometriosis. <laughs> Just can you speak a little bit about that? I think this is a, such a good thing for people to hear because it is endometriosis, right? It may not come up as stroma, stroma and cell or stroma and glands per se, but 
it may present as fibroinflammatory tissue or fibro whatever. So can you explain that a little bit more? Yes, and such a great question. Um, you know, getting that diagnosis, getting the pathology diagnosis, just validates someone. It just validates all those years of, of pain and, and, and suffering and being uh, referred from physician to physician. I think there's huge value in getting that pathology report saying, you know what, it's actually endometriosis. And I mean, you, you probably heard the stories. I have patients who break down in tears once you show them the pathology, even though uh, the surgery is, is kind of the same. You try to do your best with every single patient. So it's, it's threefold, right? The first one is, and I see this frequently where someone comes into the office, you know, I had a diagnostic laparoscopy, those are the pictures, and I don't have endometriosis. When it's actually there, I can see it. It's just not all of them are powder burn lesions. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Some of them are clear, vesicular scars. It comes in so many different uh, shapes and forms. Second thing is pathology. You do full, a full excision, I think you need to know who your pathologists are. I think you need to at least call your pathology lab in the hospital. If you have a chance, go and speak with them, show them the pictures, maybe take a small video with you to show them what you're doing and tell them how their actual wording affects someone's life. And the third thing is sometimes you don't have stroma and glands. Then that's what, that's the, the, that's the pathology requirement for them to be, for them to actually write it. Sometimes you don't have them. Sometimes, and what we see all the time is, Scarring, inflammation, hemosiderin late macrophage, and mm -hmm. all those types of things, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have endometriosis. It just wasn't seen on the microscope. And that's such a huge point. But it's also a very, um, it's a very delicate point to, to discuss with your patients because sometimes it could be seen as you're giving yourself a cop-out, you know, I mm -hmm. uh, did this big surgery for you and it might not come back positive, but you do have it. There's a lot of trust that goes into that conversation, a lot of trust. I mean, just if you look at the research on endometriosis and phenotyping and the roles, some of those things that come up in pathology are clearly stated. So it's sometimes disheartening, but I, but I find that pa patients working with doctors who can who explain that, they, they definitely feel a lot better just knowing it was endo, you know, it's a different sort of form. It could be for all these different reasons. But I get asked that question a lot, especially if patients come to me having had a surgery. It just doesn't seem complete or they're told that, sorry, you didn't have it, even if it was more complete, just from that, that wording. For sure. Yeah, that's a hot topic question. You do emphasize the, the patient-centered focus as far as their goals, you know, how you're going to approach their overall care with surgery. But you also mentioned often that you work with pain management, mental health, pelvic floor PT. Do you do that a lot before the surgery in preparation for a better outcome? Do you, do you feel that surgery is really important to get that diagnosis and kind of address the lesions and have them continue after? What does that look like? I think that it takes a village. If you're, if you're really planning on providing adequate care for chronic pelvic pain, it takes a village. I'll go back to, to, to my, my uh, first clinic visit. Whenever I'm meeting someone, I'm hearing about their experiences, I'm asking them all those symptoms that would make them have the diagnosis of, uh, diagnosis of suspect endometriosis. Second part that, that goes into um, my first physical uh, exam or my first encounter with the patient is a physical exam, not to determine if they need surgery or not. I don't think that I'll deny someone surgery just because their exam is normal. Um, I think that's poor practice, but the main reason why I do a physical exam, I'm really assessing that pelvic floor with my first physical exam. I'm assessing for, uh, sec I'm assessing for secondary pain generator generators. I'm feeling their levators. I'm looking for trigger points. I'm assessing their pubococcygeus, their piriformis. I'm doing a full assessment of their pelvic floor. That's my number one. And I usually have a whole spiel about how pelvic floor can be linked can linger even after surgery so it's a completely different pain generator than endometriosis and we can talk about that i mean you're, you're the specialist on that with central sensitization allodynia uh, hypersensitivity and all of that and the second thing I'm, I'm doing is i'm assessing for a frozen pelvis mm -hmm. you know someone that has a big nodule that's invading through the um, rectovaginal septum 
or a uterus that's completely frozen that has no mobility upwards and, and downwards or left to right. Mm -hmm. And those two things really guide my management for those patients to have the best outcome. So patients who have um, pelvic floor tension myalgia or, or high tone pelvic floor dysfunction, and they're having a lot of secondary pain generators, I tell them surgery is just the first step. You really need to establish care with a good physical therapist that is willing to spend time with you and educate you about what's going on and offer you a long-term treatment for those symptoms. Because if you do have endometriosis, excising it is just removing the primary pain generator. You're still going to have your, your pelvic floor that's going to cause you a big trouble down the road. And the second part is seeing who I need to involve with those surgery, right? Mm -hmm. For someone who has diffusely infiltrative endometriosis that's can, that can be diagnosed by your, by your initial assessment, you really have to figure out who you're involving, whether it's a urology specialist or a colorectal uh, surgeon specialist or even different specialties in the, in the operating room. So th those are, those are the, the two big aspects of my, of my clinical exam, the first clinical exam. And... Um, you know, it's just not just me doing the surgery. It's it's unrealistic expectation if you're telling them, you know what, I'll do your surgery and it's magic. You'll get better right after. It doesn't work that way. And yeah. if you're telling the patient, you know, I'm this uh, top-notch endometriosis surgeon, but I only do surgery. You know, I'll just uh, do my thing and then you figure it out. I also think it's unfair. If yeah. you're if you're if you're offering treatment, you should see it through. Yeah. So do you use imaging to help diagnose? I know that there's, you can do it. You, it's a different approach, but that's not really the standard of care here right now. And so do you still utilize it? And if so, in what type of situations? So your, your ultrasound is as good as anything else to diagnose um, rectovaginal septum involvement with endometriosis. Um, I do get a pelvic MRI because I work with different specialists who really want to look at those images. And most of the time it's um, after a prep and uh, with rectal gel. Mm -hmm. um, I sometimes do re refer my patients to an endoanal ultrasound for those who have significant um, rectal involvement for two reasons. The first one, it really tells you how close that lesion is to the anal verge. And the second one, it tells you how deep that lesion goes into the rectum that really sometimes is crucial for those colorectal, colorectal surgeons to plan their, their, their resections with it really, it's, I, I, in my opinion, I think it's crucial for how you counsel patients. You know, if you're telling someone you have this lesion, that's about three centimeters from the anal verge, this is a huge surgery is very different than someone who has an ileocecal involvement or a sigmoid involvement where you just do a bar resection and re, re the most, and they do most of the time fine after. Yeah. I think patients have the right to have full counseling that this could be, this re might require diversion. There's a high chance of leak. With the leak, there's significant medical morbidity that comes with it. Um, I, I still appreciate imaging. I don't think it changes the way I manage my patients. Uh, I have the resources. Um, I know how to interpret those images. I'm not just re relying on the read of the MRI. And uh, it still gives me value. I think... I know, I know what you, where you're coming from, that it's not essential to, to do imaging. I don't think it is essential, but in my practice, it does give me, uh, it, sheds, it sheds a little bit more light on how to surgically treat those, the most complex patients. Absolutely. You have a better map as to what you're going in with or who you need to have on your team. Yeah, hopefully that continues to go in a further direction and we have better ultrasound and imaging techniques among all the providers along that process. I think ultrasound is a little bit easier because you have more control. You could do it. You could train your staff to do it. But with MRI, it's harder depending on their, the center you send, you know, the person taking the pictures, the person interpreting it, and then you get the images. And if they didn't have great images, your interpretation only has so much value. Absolutely. I agree. A lot of times you send someone with uh, stage four endometriosis, the MRI read is normal pelvis. Yeah. It really isn't. You have to look at the at the actual images, look at the at the at different lesions within the pelvis, look at the orientation of the uterus, look at retraction sites. There there's a lot of subtleties in looking at an MRI. Yeah, and how many times have you seen somebody with a report that said normal and then you're like, oh, there, 
there. I bet yeah. that's something. All the time. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's the, I mean, it's standard now. I think that we're uh, slowly getting better, especially once you start finding partners within the radiology department. Mm -hmm. uh, I only send my patients to get MRIs in centers that I have access to actually look at the images. If, uh, if you tell me, you know what, um, insurance doesn't cover this center, I'll send you a different center that's, that I have access to because doing an MRI that I can only have access to the report is not that valuable. Yeah, exactly. You recently did just get video vetted on I Care Better, and you I know that that was announced um, through I Care Better, but also in Nancy's Nook. And tell us how that was for you. I think that um, Saeed and, um, and I Care Better and Nancy's Nook and uh, the Nook group, they both fill huge gaps in... Uh, and the way that we manage endometriosis as a, as a specialty. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, way I got, uh, the way I got interested in pursuing uh, being video vetted with, with IK Better is, uh, I, don't, I don't know if, the, if it's the typical approach, but I was caring for a lot of my patients who have endometriosis. Um, thankfully, a lot of my patients, they're well counseled, they're well heard, they get positive outcomes, and they come to me with those questions. And Dr. Tayan, how come you're not on this platform? How come you're not on I Care Better? How come you don't uh, partner up with, uh, with different uh, advocacy group? How come you're not on the NOOC? I, uh, I felt that at some point it became necessary as, as a validation, right? It, uh, it doesn't really change the way I practice. It's just, it, it's essential in this day and age because of how tricky it is to, to to care for those patients and how for those patients and uh, how tricky it is to get someone trust. There's a lot of validation. I mm -hmm. think with I Care Better specifically, they closed a huge gap in, in treating endometriosis because uh, this is going to be a long-winded answer, but uh, that's fine. <laughs> so if you're if you if you look at objective metrics, right? I'm doing a hysterectomy your metric for success, the uterus is removed, right? Mm -hmm. If you're doing a myomectomy, if you're remo removing a fibroid or a fallopian tube, your, your, metric, your metric of success is, is very objective. You can very easily know if you did a good job or not. With endometriosis, it's very different. There's a lot of trust that goes into it. And if you're operating at a, at a center that doesn't have a lot of experience with endometriosis, you're, ta you're taking a young healthy patient who's here for, for pelvic pain and you're doing this radical surgery for, there's going to be a lot of questions asked, oh, what's going on here? So there's a lot of education that goes into it. And what I Care Better has, has done, it, it gives you that validation, right? Because you can, I'm not, I, I don't think it happens that frequently, but you can just self-proclaim to be the best endometrial surgeon. You know, I decided, I woke up today and I decided I'm going to be the best surgeon around. And I'm going to start a website. I'm going to hire a, a company that's going to market me. And I'm going to start caring for patients who have endometriosis. It doesn't work that way. With other things, it's easy to figure out if you did a good job or not. With, 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 with actual different surgery, with, endo with endometriosis, it's very hard. This is where I care better just fills this huge gap. It gives patients a place that they can trust, where they can go and they know that this, this has been done right, and they do a phenomenal job. Their, their, their vetting process, I mean, it's, uh, it's very rigorous. They do a phenomenal job, and the more rigorous I saw it being, the more happy I was. It just gives you the sense of uh, exclusivity into this group that's actually been well vetted. And the other, I mean, this is from a patient perspective. From my perspective, it really validates you as a surgeon. You know, I've spent those thousands of hours doing what, what, what I love to do. I'm, I'm perfecting my, my, my skills. I'm trying. I really care for, for my patients. And here's someone who's actually validating you. I, th I think okay. it's great. Now for the Nook part, I also think it's a, it's a, I mean, she's been doing it for so many years and it became, I mean, they have close to 180,000 patients on that group. And the amount of, the wealth of information, how open it is, 
how beautiful that group is to provide this information for patients, the peer the peer to peer um, support from different um, patients who have went through this to other patients who are going through it is just unbelievable. I I think that those 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 two groups, I care better and the NOC have have really filled a huge gap for endometriosis patients. I wonder if they have it in different specialties. I was just thinking about that the once I got more uh, involved in it because I mean there's there's a lot of different specialties where it's still it's still out there in terms of uh, how care is uh, is given. I don't know if they have it for different specialties, but definitely we're lucky that we have them. What you said is exactly that, especially in North America, there there is no formality like the UK has a pretty extensive process. Um, we don't have that, and it used to be the conversation: Do you ablate? Do you excise? And you say, I excise, and that came with sort of the knowledge that you did everything. Now it's a lot of marketing and self-proclaimed, I do endometriosis, I excise, but it's not always the full story. And it's not just with surgeons. It's also with uh, physical therapy. Mm-hmm. It's also with uh, with different practice pain psychiatry. I mean, um, eventually with time and with, with, uh, with multiple referrals, you figure out who are the pelvic therapists around you who are actually bought into making this better and to perfecting their skills and who's just marketing it because Mm -hmm. it's trendy now, it's endometriosis. I mean, let's just put it on the website. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's, there's a lot of validation that comes from, uh, from uh, I care better the way that they, they bet their surgeons. It's been a rigorous process. I mean, they, uh, they identify you, they have you send surgeries, it gets reviewed. They have you send operative report, pathology report. There's so much that goes into it. And uh, I love how rigorous it is. I think it's great. Awesome. When you were picking your your surgical videos, did you have a hard time? Like, should I submit this one? Should I submit this one? Did it make you nervous? I picked three back-to-back videos. Okay. I just went uh, for it. it. Yeah, I just went for it. I think it's... Um, sure, I mean, as, as, a, as a surgeon who's who's really wanting to, to perfect it, you're never going to find your perfect video. You're, you're always going to think, you know what, I could have done this uh, thing a millimeter different this way or a millimeter different that way. It's, uh, at some point, you just need to trust that uh, you're kind of giving the, 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 the same care for all the patients and just send the videos. And it's not the end of the world if, uh, if you do not get vetted by, and I know a lot of surgeons who weren't vetted, you, you keep improving. I think there's always room for improvement for all of us. Yeah, do you get specific feedback? You know, here's where here's where we talk to you. This is what we recommend. What is that? Do you know what that feedback looks like? So it's it's blinded both ways. So mm-hmm. I don't know who is, uh, you, you send and then you get feedback, but they don't know who you are and yeah. you don't know who's giving you the feedback. But yeah, you do get feedback about uh, different techniques or uh, it's either feedback or, uh, or, or praise, you know. You, mm-hmm. you did this uh, exceptionally well and I think... There's different ways of doing it. Um, once you go out of the out of the training uh, world, you don't get feedback. You just right. uh, you're just do- yeah you're just doing your thing. I think it was refreshing uh, to just uh, read those comments because no one no one's um, no one's uh, looking at you anymore. Operating, we have trainees with us. We you you mentor them and yeah. uh, you train them, but you're not getting anyone giving you feedback. I think it was refreshing. It was great. Awesome. I've heard some feedback of surgeons and I'm like, come on, let's go get on there. And there's just this like, I don't know, like imposter syndrome type type situation. And I think that that's the reason is that now that you're practicing, like there's nobody to kind of guide you, although you're getting great outcomes, you're seeing this, but there's that level of, you know, I'm not a student anymore. I'm not a trainee and you don't have that feedback to know. So you know, one interesting thing about endometriosis surgery, um, there, the, when, whenever you're using the robot to, to operate, um, they have a system that tracks your operative times, mm-hmm. right? If, um, and they compare you to the, to the rest of the country or the rest of the surgeons who are doing the surgery um, at a very, very broad level. If you, if you look at those, and I, I compare with other friends that I have who are endometriosis uh, specialists, and you look at the, um, so there is like 90th percentile, 50th percentile in terms of time to complete the surgery. And then you have the 10th percentile, 
So if you're if you're doing it more efficiently and quicker, your your percentage kind of drops. So for those top specialists who are treating endometriosis every day, if you look at their objective measures, right, hysterectomy, you get uterus out surgeries done. Mm -hmm. If it's done for reasons different than endometriosis, they, most of them they all fall under the tenth percentile. But whenever you look at their endometriosis numbers, they all fall above the fiftieth percentile. And I think that's a huge telling sign in terms of what's being offered surgically, right? Yes. If you're logging this case as, a, as an endometriosis case, I mean, I already know you're efficient. You're doing your surgery quicker than 90% of everyone out there. So it comes to endometriosis, your, your average. It just tells you that whoever is doing those surgeries, who, who is a specialist, they're just spending more time doing deeper dissections, removing more endometriosis, and um, I definitely feel that this is probably going to be a paper published in the, in the next um, couple of years because it's, um, it's, the numbers are staggering. That's so fascinating. I had no idea about that, the robotics, but that's so great to know. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. And thanks for okay. sharing your story about the vetting process. I think it's going to be helpful for other physicians to understand a little bit better uh, I don't think it's described super well on the website. So I think hearing it from somebody who recently went through it is great. I could not recommend it more to anyone. There's so much value in it. Um, if you're doing it for one, one reason is you're just putting your name out there so you can offer what you really know uh, that, can, that can improve patient outcomes. It's just uh, your you're, you're getting your skills to more patients who need them. I think that's the, the main reason why we're all doing what we're doing. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. I know you're on Nancy's Nook. You're on I Care Better. But can you tell people more about how to find you? So this is uh, my goal for the next uh, couple of years, just to get um, more um, exposure on social media. It's, uh, it's been a lot of work, 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 not a lot of focus on, on that aspect, which I think is, is important. Um, the main way sh the main way to reach our practices is uh, you can just Google Capital Women's Care uh, Arlington or Capital Women's Care Ashburn, and uh, you can book your visit visit through the website or uh, by calling one of our practices. And um, we, uh, I mean, I promise to take excellent care of uh, of everyone who comes in to see me. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your expertise and knowledge and your approach and hopefully this helps your social media presence as well and get more people to know who you are in in the east coast especially um anything you want to share as last words of advice for patients or providers for um for patients those uh, those very very tricky questions that are hard to ask make sure you ask them every time make sure that you get very specific with your with your surgeons um, ask them how many times they've done this uh, surgery in the past week, the past month. Uh, don't be shy. You're, you're not uh, going to your doctor's office to make a friend. You're going to make sure that you're getting the best surgery possible. So I think if you land in the, in the right place, those questions will be well received. Um, for uh, surgeons out there who um, have trained so hard to, to hone their skills, uh, thank you for, for everything that you do. For everyone who works in the in the community, who uh, treats really the the ramifications of having endometriosis and the and uh, who work tirelessly to 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 improve patient outcomes, from pain psychiatry to pelvic floor therapists who are really dedicated in providing uh, top notch care. Also, big thank you. I mean, uh, what we all do is uh, is bringing a lot of patients um, a lot of benefit can't say it better. So thank you again so much. And it was great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much, Chandra, for all that what you do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. 
Connect with us on our website, iCareBetter.com, or social media platforms at iCareBetter. And let's continue this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis. Thank you.